So today I'm going to present a case that is from the VA, which is quite unusual, um, but hopefully this will work out well. It's a case of a 56-year-old man who has a history of quadriplegia due to a spinal cord injury, which is very common in our VA population. It gives us a lot of experience doing screening colonoscopies in these tough spinal cord colons. He has a history of prior ischemic colitis, and he presents to the VA to do his colorectal cancer screening. He was well appearing, abdomen was mildly distended due to sort of lack of muscle tone, but he was non-tender and a very benign abdomen. He did have an iron deficiency anemia with a hemoglobin in the nines, a low ferritin, a low transferrin saturation. And given that we decided to add an EGD to his inpatient colonoscopy, which he was admitted for with a three day prep, um, which is sort of what the spinal cord unit there specialize in. So this is what we found on his EGD. So I apologize that it's from a cell phone, but in the VA, we can't take the videos from the machine. And this is this sort of I'm trying to wash off this very friable mucosa with overlying, like almost like a zebra pattern. There's like stripy white, superficial, and then almost this kind of brown discoloration um, in the linear, on linear folds up near the, the cardia. Um, hopefully I'm trying to see if I can get better. Maybe I'll just go back to the very beginning just to freeze on a, the best shot. Maybe that's one of the better ones. So in embracing some of the guidelines that Satisha now provided us with, I would love to hear some thoughts from the audience about what anyone thinks this could be, because I I had no idea when I saw it. Um, so I'd love to hear how other people think about the finding like this on endoscopy. This is the part where people are supposed to participate. Sorry, it was this change in format. I've never done an intra intra presentation participation. <laughs> um, I have the power to call on people just so you know. I would say let's take a bunch of biopsies. I, I think it's mm -hmm. very hard to, to there's oftentimes we see these very bizarre gastritis patterns that I think are going to be something insane and then there's something like chronic non-specific gastritis. So I probably would have just taken samples from multiple areas in the stomach to try to get a sense of sort of the global picture of the um, mucosa and then more specific targeted lesion uh, biopsies of this particular area. So are these, Hang, Zoe. are these thick and gastric folds? Is that what you're showing us? Yeah, so they are. They're, they're thick and sort of inflamed with little white stripes, like ulcerated folds, what they look like, or like shallow ulcerations in the folds. So the differential diagnosis for thickened gastric folds includes Menetrier's disease, uh, secondary syphilis, uh, lymphoma occasionally, uh, maybe nonspecific gastritis, but those are the things that come to my mind. Thanks, Dr. Esquitz. I was worried about lymphoma because it was sort of infiltrating a lot of the folds and I haven't seen, I've only seen one or two cases of gastric lymphoma, but similar to Zoe, I was like, maybe this is just a strange gastritis, but I'm worried that it's a, a bizarre malignancy. This was all that you found to explain his anemia? Yeah, his colon was fine. Doesn't look very ulcerated. No. No. But I'm bleeding, right? It, it was bleed. It was yeah. It was like with just washing, it bled. Yeah, I try not um, to describe things as inflamed, by the way, because you really don't know. You know, that's really a pathologic diagnosis. But you know, if it bleeds, if it bleeds on contact mm -hmm. or with washing, um, I've seen that in lymphocytic gastritis or collagenous gastritis. True. Ah, but usually, okay. those have like like it, it's not these linear uh, lesions. They're pinpoint, you know, punctate lesions, not doesn't look like this. Right, right. Yeah. Um, lymphoma, right, is a, it, it, lymphoma is an interesting thought, though. I mean, it, it's sort of like it doesn't have a typical appearance. It can kind of just look it's sort of like uh, nonspecifically abnormal. Um, obviously, need a biopsy. Yeah. So we did biopsy. But first, I'm going to ask one of the applicants a question. Let me see. 
<laughs> only joking. That's definitely not typical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only joking. Unless you would like to offer your thoughts, we're going to move on to the pathology. Um, so the pathology showed, as predicted by many of the audience, that there was it was there was superficial ulceration, mild chronic non-specific gastritis, and no H. pylori. So I think it was a good learning case for me in that things can look absolutely wild on endoscopy and then the pathology will really often give you the, the answer. So I think it's so important to take biopsies from everywhere. The other thing that we noticed was if you look at where the gastritis was, it was up near the cardia. And what I think it was, was mechanical gastritis from the patient retching during his bowel prep. Um, this is a phenomenon, it's like a Mallory Weiss tear, except what happens is in patients with sliding hiatal hernias, when they retch, their stomach can slide through the hernia and you get friction right where the diaphragmatic ring is. And that causes, what we saw was that the gastritis was parallel and um, on the two sides opposite each other, like almost circumferentially. So that makes us, and it was very close to the GE junction, making me think that maybe it was due to his hernia and due to the gastric mucosa sliding against the diaphragmatic ring as it prolapsed. I coined a term for it, the Mallory Weiss tear of the stomach, which hopefully will help you remember this mechanical gastritis of the cardia. There was one case series that I found looking at it. So they had five patients with huge upper GI bleeds who had emergent inpatient endoscopies. All had been vomiting prior to hematemesis. And just like a Mallory Weiss tear, the vomitus was non-bloody initially, but as they continued to vomit, it turned into a coffee ground or bright red. None of them need blood needed blood transfusion. So I guess it gives you a sense of this being a sort of lower volume GI bleed. And then just out of interest, I pulled up all the patients who were not like our patient, they were young. Most of them had either overeaten or drunk some alcohol. So it's sort of that similar to the Mallory Wise population. Um, and then I was curious in China in the 1990s, how quick would you get an endoscopy? Actually pretty quickly. I think they probably, if we looked at a case series of five of our patients, these Chinese patients might've gotten there more quickly to their EGD. So quickest was four hours and then there was an outlier at 58 hours. They all had hiatal hernias and you can see they marked where the gastric mucosa became congested and uh, looking, not gonna use the word inflamed, congested and um, it, like erosions um, and like active oozing of blood. So this was sort of uh, laid out here. They all had hiatal hernias. And the good news is they all had a cure, which was, it was great to see. They also looked at 748 patients who came in for serial endoscopies. They looked at the EGD findings of all their patients over um, a period of time. And they found that if you were nauseated, if you had serious nausea and had a hiatal hernia, you were more likely to have congestion and erosion in these areas that we mentioned. So that sort of lended more weight to their the hypothesis that these this was a mechanical gastritis of, of the cardia. So to conclude, it can occur as a sequela of retching and vomiting. It's found in patients with a sliding hiatal hernia, often alcohol use. It's a rare cause of GI bleed. I certainly haven't seen it, except in this patient who was bleeding slowly. And the history might be similar to that of a Mallory Weiss tear. So if you're getting the history of initially brown and then bloody vomitus, maybe keep this possibility in mind. So with that, I'll open up to any questions. And this is a Halloween theme sli slide from the good old days. So happy Halloween to everyone. Yeah, I have a question. The yeah, so. question for the scope was anemia, right? So presumably something else was probably driving the actual underlying anemia. Is Are you guys gonna do a capsule or something like that? We are actually gonna do a capsule. Um, I think there is something else driving the anemia because I don't think that Gastritis has been intermittently bleeding for months and months. Got it. And how well substantiated was his history of ischemic colitis? Oh, we pretty well substantiated. He was scoped by us in, I think, by a cash in 2018 um, for bleeding. And they saw a really thickened area in the sigmoid that they thought was malignancy, actually. And they were consulting oncology and surgery. And then the pathology came back as ischemic colitis. And then on repeat, they went back and it had healed up. Why do you ask? Well, I, you know, you haven't really explained his iron deficiency anemia. And, you know, occasionally ischemic colitis can be also mechanical. It could be like a volvulus that twisted and then untwisted or an internal hernia. 
And somebody who's quadriplegic and doesn't have the same degree of sensation may not have the same degree of pain that some, you know, someone with an intact nervous system would, would feel the pain of ischemia. So uh, when you did the colonoscopy, was it a very redundant floppy colon or, I mean, it's definitely, just, yeah. I mean, you know, could he be sort of intermittently, you know, could there be a volvulus or something else intermittent that's causing mm -hmm. some, a little bleeding, drops his hemoglobin occultly. <clears throat> it's just a thought. Aren't those, I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, aren't yeah. those tumorin ulcers? That's a, that's a good point. I, I think the distinction, uh, well, I don't know, maybe the history of the vomiting and the fact that it's it's more of a, like it's not, it's mucosa that's not usually in the hernia, but prolapses all the way up from much more distally in the stomach. I think that might be the difference, but yes, they're very similar. I think Cameron's ulcers are a little bit more chronic, like a long-standing feature, um, as opposed to something acute that uh, Steph was describing with this acute vomiting. We used to, um, first of all, I love your Halloween party and I'd like to be there. Um, and uh, we, if you looked up, you might find this under another name. We used to call this something, um, a metagenic injury. So, you know, like emesis. Um, so there might be some more literature on a metagenic injury if you look it up. Oh, cool. Thank you. Great. Any other questions, comments on this case? No. All right. Before we um, go over to Yu Yang, we should have done this before, and that was my mistake. Steve, would you like to uh, introduce the applicants that are joining us this morning? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Nikhil. So mm -hmm. we'd like to welcome our applicants today. We have six people visiting us uh, remotely, uh, and I apologize if I don't pronounce your names correctly, uh, so please forgive me. So we have Danny Wong from Brigham and Women's Hospital. Feel free to wave if you like. Uh, Amanda Pibeneto. Uh, Suzanne from Mass General, uh, Suzanne L. Shafee from Mass General, Frederick Rosenstein from Icon School of Medicine, Beth Israel campus, Brian Horwich from University of Southern California. Brian, thank you for waking up early. And Amanda Sue from Johns Hopkins. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to speaking with you later. Okay, Nikhil, thanks. Thanks, Steve. And again, uh, welcome to all the applicants. Um, Ying, you want to present your yes, case? Yes, I'll, um, let me just share my screen. Can I for a second? Oh. Um, welcome everyone, I'm Ying. I'm one of the first year fellows. Um, I'm excited to share a cool case that Dave and I did um, a couple weeks ago. So our case begins with, oh, sorry. Our case begins with a 64-year-old female. She has a history of CKD3, alcohol cirrhosis, HEF-PEF, your usual Sinai patient, um, who initially presented with volume overload. She had a really long hospitalization. By the time we saw her, it was a, she had been in the hospital already for 20 days, um, and we were consulted for hematochesia. And she had a CT abdomen pelvis that was done a couple of days ago that was just notable for colitis. She has some significant stool burden in the rectum that was noted. And um, she was starting on ceftriaxone flagell empirically, but despite having like almost a complete course of the antibiotics, she had persistent leukocytosis to the 20s. Her last colonoscopy in 2016, done by a Dr. Iskowitz actually, had just diverticulosis in the transverse colon. Um, and when Dave and I went to see her, she was very delirious. And when we did our rectal exam, it was something um, like some I've seen before, she had this very large stool ball that we could see protruding from her rectum with overlight lying cloth. So we recommended disimpaction. Um, I think you're in uh, presenter mode, so we only see, we can see. Uh... Oh, sorry. Let me see. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Hang on. Let me see if I can share my other screen. And this, while she's doing that, this large stool ball looked very much like, you know, sort of obstetrical views of babies crowning. I mean, this is like the biggest thing I can ever remember. Fecal crowning? <laughs> it was definitely fecal crowning. If you had, I mean, if we, if we were able to take a picture, which would have been all wrong there, I mean, that's exactly what it would look like. What was the, what was the APGAR score? 
<laughs> mine or the patient's. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, I had to grab Dave because I wasn't sure what I was um, looking at <laughs> to get him to come uh, look at it with me. Okay, so hopefully this is better. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Um, so after the team disimpacted the patient, um, she had large volume hematochesia, so came through multiple pads um, with hypotension requiring pressors. Um, and we thought the bleeding was secondary to stercoral ulcers, um, which uh, result from pressure necrosis from the mucosa as a direct effect of the adjacent hard fecal mass. It's actually termed sibilum. Um, over time, the pressure of the sibilum can result in local skin necrosis, ulceration, and in rare cases, actually to perforation. Um, although Constipation and fecal impaction are commonly observed as complications of leading to stercoral ulceration. It's actually quite uncommon. The risk factors in our um, patient included sort of like renal failure. Most commonly happens in the rectal sigmoid region um, and we'll show a little bit later on the scope where her ulceration was, but um, commonly in the left side because it's more dehydrated and hard feces in that area a more narrow diameter with high pressure and a relatively poor blood supply. And I was just thinking how rare it was that a fecal disimpaction led to this massive um, hematochesia, but there've been some case reports um, that uh, have shown that fecal disimpaction can actually precipitate rectal hemorrhage when you um, remove the, the fecal mass um, because you're kind of disturbing the adherent clot that had formed over the ulceration. So unfortunately, I don't have a um, video, but I hope you guys can appreciate that these are, um, for the applicants, very abnormal um, endoscopic images. So as, as it was ended up being a flexible sigmoidoscopy because this patient was um, in the ICU. Um, and the first image just shows um, what I encountered as soon as I went in, which was a massive amount of clotted blood in the rectum that was ultimately dislodged um, bravely by Dave because I, I was too scared to push through, push through this. Um, and then after we pushed away the clot, um, we saw sort of so um, many areas of like really deep ulceration along the rectal wall. We ended up using uh, first a bipolar cautery, um, many applications because she actually started um, hemorrhaging actively while we were um, in the scope. And then ultimately we were not able to achieve hemostasis with just bipolar cautery. So we performed rescue application of hemospray um, that resulted in temporization of bleeding. Um, her hemoglobin remained in the eights after multiple transfusions. She ultimately re uh, received like eight units of blood, three units of FFP and platelets as well. The rectum was packed by surgery overnight, but she continued to have bleeding. Um, so ultimately this is not what would, I, I think your, your first step obviously, but IR embolized her bilateral inferior rectal arteries, um, which allowed us to get definitive control. Um, and this is just a review of the rectal arterial supply, um, which just shows that the inferior rectal arteries are coming off of the internal iliacs. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about something I, you know, this is the first time I've seen hemospray being used um, and what is the evidence for it in active lower GI bleeding. So, Lower GI bleeding remains, I think, a management challenge in that it's still relatively controversial in terms of evidence of the, of the role of early in, uh, colonoscopy, meaning within like 24 hours. It, some earlier data show that it can identify the source of bleeding in up to 80% of patients, although there was just um, a review published in this year that showed that colonoscopy within 24 hours doesn't reduce further bleeding or mortality in patients hospitalized with acute lower GI bleeding. I think uh, a lot of this is heterogeneous data because obviously the approaches differ depending on the nature of bleeding and timing of the presentation, especially in our patient's case who is you know, actively bleeding out. Um, in general, lower GI bleeding um, um, can be self-limited in up to 90% of patients, but 10% have like severe or ongoing hematochesia. Um, our traditional endoscopic treatment approaches for the applicants for bleeding include sort of like injection therapy, mechanical therapy, like using clips or band ligation and thermal therapy with monopolar or bipolar 
um, coagulation, APC, um, and endoscopic treatments usually can be used, you know, alone or in combination. Um, one thing we don't talk as much about is um, topical hemostatic powders. Some of the, I've listed some of the pros for them, um, including the fact that they can be applied to sites that are difficult to reach with an endoscope because it can be applied tangentially over a wide field, especially in cases where like, um, you know, direct contact with the site is actually very challenging. It can also treat large areas with diffuse hemorrhage or areas when, where you can't exactly see where the bleeding is, and it does not require contact with the bleeding site, so it doesn't cause additional mucosal um, damage. It can also be used as a monotherapy, which, you know, we don't suggest, but combination therapy with other hemostatic methods, a rescue therapy in our case, or like a failed different hemostatic method. Um, and sometimes it's used just as a temporizer before transferring the patient to a more stable setting so that we can try some other things. So how does this work? Um, so each canister of hemostatic powder contains 20 grams of this proprietary inorganic material. The delivery device um, has a compressed carbon dioxide propellant, this red thing that you have to load up before you uh, use it, and a delivery catheter that is um, threaded through the working channel of the endoscope. When the powder is sprayed on an actively bleeding site under direct endoscopic visualization, it becomes um, a, a cohesive, it acts as a cohesive sort of adhesive powder and forms a mechanical barrier to additional bleeding. Um, the powder is non-toxic and it does not absorb or is not metabolized by the body. Um, for the successful application, the hemospray catheter must be kept dry. I think one thing that we encountered that was challenging was that the catheter can become clogged during the hemospray application. It's such a common problem that each of the hemospray actually come with two catheters because the powder actually reacts with moisture to form this adhesive gel. Um, the theoretical risks of uh, the hemospray include perforation, delivery of powder under pressure, especially sometimes in the right side of the colon and cecum or in the presence of diverticula. Um, and I think many people had heard that hemospray had a class two device recall in from 2019 to early 2020, secondary to like misassembly of the device. So it wasn't working when people were trying to use it in bleeding cases. So I found this um, great article in GIE that was the first sort of randomized control study for the successful hemostasis, hemostasis of active lower GI bleeding. Um, this study was called the approach study and a prospective observational cohort study of hemospray for lower GI bleeding. Um, so the use of hemospray has been reported in several case series in patients with upper and lower GI bleeding. Um, and this represents sort of the uh, most comprehensive prospective study um, with an established clinical protocol and um, a 30 day follow up. So 50 patients with active lower GI bleeding from multiple different causes were enrolled in this prospective multi-center um, study at four tertiary centers in Canada. The powder was used in monotherapy, combination therapy, or rescue therapy. And the primary endpoint was actually adverse events within 30 days of the index procedure. And then the secondary endpoints were initial hemostasis as well as recurrent bleeding and mortality within 30 days of the index procedure. So most patients um, in the study had um, bleeding uh, at a single bleeding site, and most bleeding was secondary to polypectomy. Um, sorry, polypectomy. Um, so not on this table was the size of lesion. So most of the, the lesions in the studies were less than one centimeter, so um, quite small. The powder was applied as monotherapy in 13 bleeding sites as um, combination therapy in the majority of cases um, in 42% and as rescue therapy in 32%. And very notably, I think what was really um, the takeaway from the study is that hemostasis was achieved in 98% of patients and no patient experienced a powder-related adverse events. 10% um, of patients developed recurrent bleeding within 30 days um, and then one patient died within 30 days, but it was not uh, related to the hemostatic powder use. So the recurrent bleeding rate of the 10%, I think, is um, sort of within range of what's reported for non-topical hemostatic treatments in lower GI bleeding. Um, 
So my takeaway points are that like a high rate of hemostasis was achieved with a low rate of recurrent bleeding. There were no adverse events um, and the mortality rate is sort of in line with what's reported for other hemostatic treatments. So it's an effective and safe tool to have in your back pocket for lower GI bleeding for that matter, for upper GI bleeding as well. It can be used in combination with our traditional approaches with a, comp a comparative sort of like re-bleeding rate versus sort of the other um, traditional approaches that we have. You should always have a backup plan um, in these cases as, uh, as we did immediately after the procedure, they had to call, you know, IR surgery in case that, you know, even your hemospray fails to achieve um, durable hemostasis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, it's Maya. Um, so we can actually give you a uh, follow-up on this case because we're on service now. And we were called about this patient yesterday um, with Lauren. So um, to kind of talk about what you had said at the beginning, which is when they disimpact, they might kind of bleed briskly. So I guess the team was being super aggressive after she had developed that strip or also the first time. It was disimpacting her daily. Um, and I'm not sure how long their fingernails were because they seem to have caused a visible vessel to just kind of like open up uh, about one centimeter across from her dentate line. So when we went into scope her yesterday, she had become hypotensive and tachycardic. It was quite unstable. And the old ulcers were clean based. They were not actively bleeding. And there was this very kind of brisk visible vessel that, like I said, was just about one centimeter proximal to the dentate line. Um, and so Lauren very expertly injected epi and tamponaded the vessel and then just burned it to oblivion and the bleeding stopped and the patient's so far been stable. Um, so I think it's going to say that they should disinfect or maybe they shouldn't disinfect so aggressively. <laughs> um, we had been worried about sending her back to IR and IR was worried as well because um, it wasn't clear if the bleed yesterday was in the same territory as the bleed when you guys had scoped her two weeks ago. And so there was a very kind of big risk of uh, concern for ischemia. Um, and so that's why she can go to IR immediately. Um, but we were able to treat it, fingers crossed, she'll, she'll stay stable for now at least. Um, but the other thing that we were thinking about, because it was so close to the dentate line, I don't know if the surgeons on the call could comment, that maybe over sewing that visible vessel could be an option as well. But that is definitely a possibility. That's Brian Katz. That's Brian. That's definitely a possibility with a rigid, uh, with a proctoscopy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, One it's striking how much bleeding has occurred from this, um, you know, I don't want to call it seemingly trivial, but I mean, this sort of like routine problem has caused this woman just an unbelievable amount of, uh, you know, led her into a zillion procedures, difficult procedures. So it's sort of oh, a yeah. lesson that, you know, a common problem can really lead down a bad path. The other comment about hemospray is that it obviously is temporizing, right? You're not really treating the underlying problem. So um, you do have to address what's actually going on underneath it. All of this is really buying time and either allowing, you know, life to sort of solve the problem itself or give you time to make another plan. Yeah, with uh, hemospray, I kind of look at it as a salvage technique when traditional endoscopic ones have failed. And you know, we've only had this in the States in 2018, there was that brief recall, which was related to the CO2 canister getting dislodged and um, in some cases almost projectile uh, to have the potential to cause injury. But just a couple of other points to note with hemospray. Um, sometimes I've, I've actually completely switched to a, a dry new scope because as you alluded to, um, it really, any anytime there's moisture or any wetness is when that nanopowder is gonna get activated. So using a new scope sometimes will be beneficial um, and you don't want to, I won't even hook up water to the, um, to the scope because you, you, you have the temptation of stepping on the pedal to clear your visualization and then you're going to introduce again uh, water and moisture um, and then you know once you, once you use the spray you really won't be able to see anything. I mean it's a profuse whiteout um, so you, you spray and then you kind of let it be and you do have to be mindful about the rebleed rate as you alluded to 10%, in some cases up to 20%. So you have to make sure we keep an eye on those patients and um, you know continue to follow them. And one of the other areas that I like, which we traditionally have not had great endoscopic therapy as well, is malignancy bleeding. You can utilize this um, endoscopic technique as well. So um, just in the interest of time, we'll, we'll um, 
kick over to Nick, our advanced endoscopy fellow, for um, for one last case before uh, we have our great grand round speaker, Ali Rapici. Nick. Thanks, Nikhil. I will share my screen. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick. I'm the advanced endoscopy fellow, and I'm going to present a case of transoral incisionless fundification. No diagnostic mystery. This one's more endoscopic focused. Uh, so first, the patient. Uh, he was a 39-year-old male presented with GERD. He initially presented with chest pain. He was found to have pretty severe esophagitis. His esophagitis actually healed with PPI, and he felt better. And then he made some lifestyle modifications, but he still had persistent GERD. So anytime he came off PPI, basically, his symptoms came back. And this is a good patient that highlights kind of where TIF might fit in for GERD treatment. But he's a young man. And basically, his options are to continue PPI to help him feel better, but that might be a lifelong many years of medication, which he didn't want to do. Surgery, which carries the risks of the surgery, but also uh, with fund application, many patients have post-operative symptoms, including dysphagia, bloating, and flatulence that can be very uncomfortable, sometimes more uncomfortable than the GERD, um, or TIF. And so ultimately, we chose to do TIF, and I'll show the procedure and then explain um, a little more about it. So... Preoperatively, this was an endoscopy, a little bit of an irregular Z-line, no esophagitis, no giant hiatal hernia. Um, he has a hill grade one flat valve, uh, which is relevant because we're trying to shape this anatomy, right? So this is sort of, uh, it's, it's reasonably tight, but um, sort of flat. And we will reshape that to be more of a reflux barrier. This is an image of the device in action. So outside the body, it's two operators. It's sort of like a gun-like device. And it's the scope actually goes through the channel. It's a 60 French device. So um, the scope is really used almost like in a laparoscopy case, just as a camera. You don't do the procedure with the scope. The device itself does all of the work. Uh, and we will see that here. So this is Again, before doing the procedure, just a look to evaluate the valve. You wanna carefully evaluate the anatomy and make sure that it's gonna be safe and appropriate for this procedure. And this is the device. So again, the goal with this is that we're trying to lengthen this flap. And then we can also actually simulate essentially a fund application with a wrap. So by grabbing the tissue and twisting the device, you can simulate a wrap endoscopically and actually create a 270 degree wrap around the GE junction. And you can also pull the tissue in and then there are full thickness fasteners that hold it in place to lengthen that flat valve. So the main steps of this procedure are that, as you can see, there's a tissue helix in the tissue and then using traction on the tissue helix and using uh, suction, the tissue is pulled up into the device and then uh, the device is fired and it places these full thickness fasteners as we will see. So this is all getting set up to pull the tissue in and then we will start using suction to desufflate the stomach and then tissue will come up uh, and the fasteners will be fired. Skip through a little bit of adjusting here. So this is the suctioning part, kind of lose visualization. While during this part, actually a lot of action is happening outside the body. This is when the device is rotated and the flap is created, the wrap. Um, and then as we re-insulate the stomach, you're gonna see a big difference in the valve. So you can see that the tissue has been wrapped around and also it's significantly longer, more tissue into the stomach here. Once we think we have a satisfactory wrap, satisfactory uh, tissue in the device, then the device is fired and we'll actually see the fasteners. So those are the, oh, now I skipped way back.
Sorry, Nick, are you, you're yeah. like looking upside down at it, right? Yeah, so you're everything kind of is Sorry, in retroflexion. The device is, yeah. the scope is through the device and it's completely retroflexed and we're just using it as a camera. So we're watch. looking back up essentially- At the GE junction. At the GE junction, is that right? Yes. Cool, yes. thanks. Should have explained that to start. Oh, sorry. So these are these little blue things uh, here are they they're like H shaped fasteners and they're like full thickness fasteners that go through the mucosa. So as this proceeds, we place two of those fasteners there, each firing of the device places two fasteners. And ultimately you place 20 or potentially more fasteners um, to create this wrap. So we had already on the left, uh, we repeated that process a couple times on the left side of the G junction for six fasteners. Now we move to the right and we're going to do the same thing. Instead of wrapping around to the left, we wrap around to the right to try to create this full wrap and place six more fasteners there on the right. And then it does get a little bit bloody. Uh, and then we go back to, I'm just skipping ahead in the interest of time, but it would go back to the middle um, and place additional fasteners kind of to bolster this flap and really increase the length. How long does this take? Uh, it depends. You know, there's definitely a learning curve with this device because it's very clunky. Ultimately, at experienced uh, centers, it's less than an hour. When, once you get going, there's sort of a rhythm to it. And, what, and you know, what Nick's not saying is that there's two endoscopists. So I'm yeah. controlling one portion of the scope. Uh, I'm controlling the device, Nick's controlling the scope. So we have to, it's sort of like a dance and you have to work in conjunction with each other. But once you sort of get the rhythm, it, it, it takes about a half hour, 40 minutes. Uh, so- Go watch Chris dance. <laughs> um, so, in the end, this is the end result. Uh, on the left, you see the pre-op kind of a flat valve. It is tight, but it's not much of a reflux barrier. On the right, you can see a bulked up lengthened valve with a wrap that's really tight to the scope. And that ultimately is what creates the reflux barrier. So TIF, I think is a good option in two pa main pa patient populations, um, either patients that aren't responding to BPI or with proven GERD or patients that are PPI responsive but don't want to take medications. The only formal contraindications are a large hiatal hernia, which just make it difficult to perform the procedure, uh, a large BMI or surgical anatomy that would prevent you from performing the procedure. I will say the hiatal hernia doesn't stop us necessarily because we can engage our surgeons to repair the hiatal hernia at the same time as we do the TIF, which is called a, a hybrid TIF or a combination uh, hiatal hernia repair TIF, so that's not an absolute either. Um, and then some kind of relative contraindications are a large open flat valve or severe esophagitis. And here are some outcomes. Um, on the left, this is a quality of life score, higher is worse. So you can see these patients were improved with PPI but still had a pretty high score. And then after TIF, persistently for up to five years, they had much improved quality of life. On the right, you can see the percentage of patients that came off PPI at five years. 34% uh, of patients were back on PPI, but that means over 60% were off PPI completely after TIF. And this is pretty consistent with surgery without those side effects that I mentioned potentially from surgery. That is that. Thank yeah, you. I have a few questions. Uh, first, um, it looked like there may be a short Barrett esophagus there, very short. Uh, on one edge of the uh, CE junction. Uh, what happens to a Barrett when you do this? Good question. I'm glad you asked. We are actively researching this question. We, uh, because the pathogenesis of Barrett's probably involves, you know, acid exposure, and we think the TIF can reduce acid exposure, uh, we're actually investigating potential use of TIF in refractory Barrett's patients, and we will let you know, so stay tuned. <laughs> but this patient did not have Barrett's on biopsies. Even though it is in a way who brought us poem uh, has a new method for doing this. You make an injection just like an EMR around the CE junction, put a snare around it and you snare off big pieces of gastric mucosa near the CE <laughs> junction 
and with uh, cicatrization, the, uh, the orifice actually closes. Sometimes it's closed a little bit too tight and you have to dilate it, but uh, in a way has this new method of doing it. Um, I've seen it uh, done in, um, in um, India and uh, there was so much bleeding, I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> the third thing, the third thing I'd like to say is congratulations to David Greenwald, who was this week installed as president of the American College of Gastroenterology. Congratulations, David. Yay. Thanks, Terry. Okay. Yay! <laughs> I think Bruce has a few words he'd like to say as well. Yes, it's a perfect segue. I, I too want to uh, just pause for a minute and recognize this uh, very momentous occasion where Dave Greenwald, our wonderful friend and colleague, teacher, educator, um, clinician extraordinaire, um, rises to the presidency of the ACG. It's an incredibly big job in an incredibly difficult year, which will make it a very di different year for him as a president. But we know that Dave um, is so accomplished, so smart, so hardworking, so energetic, so nice, just really, as I said, such a wonderful friend, colleague, teacher, that uh, we know this is going to be a successful year for the ACG. So I want to offer him congratulations. And Akil has a short video that he's going to show. Can you guys see the, see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It is a great honor and privilege to bestow this presidential medal. It represents the leadership of the college. I know it's going to be a chance. Thank you. Your year as president of the American College of Gastroenterology has been amazing, and I am very proud to step in as president of this great organization now for the next year. Thank you so much. Congratulations, David. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, it is the tradition of the American College of Gastroenterology to award a past president's medal to those who have served as president, and so now it's my turn to give you that past president's medal. That's your name engraved on the back. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. It's a great honor to serve, and I know that this is going to be a great year. <laughs> Central Park, of course. Our, uh, our wives and then some bystanders who thought that, like, I think they thought we were getting married, but um, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Dave. It's a, such a huge job and you're going to do an amazing job. Thanks very much. It was really fun. That, that ceremony usually occurs at a, you know, business meeting in person. So, you know, we were able to take it into Central Park, do it on our own, and uh, kind of create our own our own appropriately socially distanced masked and uh, you know, <laughs> little ceremony. But it was really nice, and and uh, yeah, it is a big job, but it'll be a lot of fun. And I thank everybody for the support um, around the institution over the past number of years that I've been here, and and in the coming year, because um, that's the way that you accomplish anything is with great support from the people around you. So thanks everybody. <laughs>